broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. The topic for discussion is do's and don'ts for businesses to be VAT compliant in the UAE. Our speakers for today are Jigar Doshi and Shiraz Khan. They will share their insights about preparing and adapting to the new VAT regime to ensure a smooth transition of commercial, of commercial operations, as well as minimizing the risk of default under the new law and consequent penalties. Jigar Doshi is a qualified chartered accountant and partner with SKP's indirect tax practice. He has over 12 years of experience in indirect taxation. Jigar specializes in value added tax, goods and services tax, customs duty, excise duty, and foreign trade policy. He has extensive experience in service tax advisory, compliance, refund assessments, as well as representations in litigation. He has assisted corporates on the optimization of indirect tax costs and has been working with clients across industries. Jigar has also trained various government officials in India and has conducted GST trainings at various forums. He is also a member of the panel at India's National Academy of Customs Excise and Narcotics. Shiraz Khan is a UK qualified lawyer with over 15 years of international tax experience. He is a senior tax advisor at Al Tamimi and Company. He has worked with a prominent international law firm in the UK and big four firms in both the UK and the Middle East. Shiraz specializes in advising on international tax structuring and tax aspects of cross border MA, private equity structured finance, Islamic finance, and real estate transactions. He has in-depth knowledge and expertise across all taxes, including corporate tax, withholding tax, and VAT in a wide range of industry sectors. Shiraz regularly speaks at conferences and seminars on international tax issues and has been involved in advising governments on the drafting of tax laws. Welcome, Jagar and Shiraz. We're happy to have you host the webinar for all our listeners. Please note that all our listeners are in listen-only mode. If you have any questions, Please share them with us through the question box on the right hand side of your screen and we'll address your queries at the end of the webinar. Without any further delay, we'll start the webinar with Jigar. Jigar, over to you. An overview, I'm sure we all of us are uh, already glued on to these aspects, uh, have heard about it, have uh, you know, uh, understood various aspects, but briefly touching base on the activity, uh, you know, the GCC VAT agreement has been formed uh, wherein six countries have signed up uh, and all the Gulf countries introducing uh, the VAT at any given point of time will have to ensure that they form uh, and finalize the rate as per this structure and as per the, that boundary. So various aspects has been covered under the agreement. Uh, considering the fact that we are focusing on the UAE VAT law, uh, we have to, uh, you know, we will directly focus on the UAE side, but this is what we have to understand. This is going to be flowing from the Gulf VAT agreement. Coming to UAE law, uh, uh, there are four basic pillars of any uh, we are following uh, that aspect under the law. Uh, with any law, there comes a regulation or rules around it. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, the fact that there is an executive regulations referred under the law more than almost 60 times, uh, uh, which says that various aspects will be covered under the executive regulation. Now, that regulation uh, uh, is recently announced uh, by the FTA, which is the authority governing the UAE VAT. Uh, and they have said that within a few days, they will be putting up in the public domain. While the draft executive 
regulations are gazetted, uh, they'll remain draft. Uh, I don't expect uh, many changes, if any, uh, from the regulations which will, will, which will be published by the tax authorities this week. Uh, so that's the only thing I wanted to highlight. Sure, sure. Thank you so much. So basically the law is out. Uh, obviously, a good amount of time we already have uh, had to understand what law is all about. Executive regulations draft is out, uh, but we should be waiting for the final gazetted not uh, notification or the regulations to be out on the website, which is uh, according to us probably in the next five to seven days. Uh, there is also a tax procedure law, uh, which is you know published. If you see in the slide on the 1st of August, so before the actual law on the uh, tax side was out, there was a procedural law which was published by the government, and that was basically to highlight on the audits, uh, assessments, record keeping, etc. So. Uh, to just to give a heads up to the industry on what all procedures uh, the government is expecting the UAE entities to follow. And the regulations to that law was also published uh, later during the uh, month, wherein uh, you know the regulations on the procedural law was also out. So if we summarize the, uh, the framework of the UAE VAT laws, we have a law uh, which is the governing law. Uh, we have an executive regulation to the law which is going to come up very soon. We have a tax procedure law and we have a executive regulations of the tax procedure law, which one has to go through and understand to uh, find out the nitty gritties of uh, the government uh, process and the thought process around various activities. Obviously, there are FAQs, etc. also being issued and uh, government has also issued uh, presentations and awareness campaigns uh, for ensuring that the government or the industry is coming on board as far as UAE VAT is concerned. Coming to the basic concepts of VAT, uh, Obviously, we all are aware that uh, uh, as a Gulf country or a UAE, uh, you know, as a country, uh, there was no VAT earlier. And hence, uh, we all have to also understand the basic concepts, which, which I will brush through very quickly. So uh, the first question is who, uh, you know, who is going to pay taxes is uh, the answer is supplier. Uh, the supplier, whoever is supplying goods or services, uh, that is a person who will be making payment of taxes, who they will be liable to make payment. Uh, and also there are certain situations wherein the reverse recipient will have to pay. For example, uh, import of goods into UAE is also a taxable activity in the UAE VAT law uh, and the recipient, whoever is the importer, will have to pay taxes. So there is more, I mean, on a standard principle, the supplier is liable to pay and uh, there are some certain exceptions where even the recipient will have to pay. On what? It is on supply. So uh, it is not on any manufacturing activity, not on trading, not on you know, sale, it is on supply of goods or services. So the ambit is pretty wide uh, to cover various aspects uh, within the supply definition, which we will be taking up next. When uh, one has to pay, uh, that is defined under the date of supply provisions. So that also we have one slide to explain on when one has to pay taxes, but that is following part of the date of supply. Where we have to pay is also a question wherein whether any activity is taxable or not in UAE will be determined by the place of supply provision or the articles. So place of supply article will decide if the uh, place of supply is in UAE, the activity would be taxable in UAE. Otherwise, if it's outside UAE, the taxable uh, the activity cannot be, tax be taxable in the UAE VAT law. On what value? It is, uh, again, the value uh, art articles uh, which mentions that, you know, the transaction value and the value which is the relevant value which will be uh, taken up uh, for the supply by the supplier will be the amount on which the taxes will have to be paid. And there are certain inclusions and exclusions put in the article to ensure that what is expected uh, for the computation. Also relevant to know is uh, the, uh, whatever is on the expenditure side by the company uh, and they would be paying VAT on that, that would be available to them as a credit uh, or the amount which will be recoverable from the government against the output liability. So how to compute is what we have mentioned is basically the output tax, which is the amount that you will recover from the uh, recipient of the goods or, or the services minus uh, the input tax, which is the amount that you would be paying uh, to the vendors. So that amount, uh, you know, the seamless credit would be available and the government would recover the net amount, which is the why it is called value added tax. So any value addition that would be done, uh, that is the amount on which VAT will have to be paid and government would recover the money. The rate of tax we discussed was 5% and obviously compliance is uh, all the Invoicing, the record keeping, the registration returns have to be ensured appropriately done. 
some important concepts i will uh, again you know uh, uh, talk on some important concepts in detail little detail manner and some uh, not in detail for example the tax scope uh, that's again what we said is on the supply of goods or services so any taxable supply happening on goods or services would be captured uh, under the taxable net if you see the definition of goods is wide enough to cover even water uh, electricity uh, you know uh, so the, the intention even the uh, real estate so the intention is the goods definition is wide enough to cover uh, tangible goods as well uh, and certain other aspects uh, more importantly the service definition is uh, much wider which says that anything other than goods would be services so uh, you know the the mutually exclusive definition uh, ensure that entire ambit is covered under the taxable supply net and ensuring that uh, activity done by any person, any transaction happening within the UAE law, within the UAE country, that will be liable to tax. There is also a concept of deemed supply, which means that if there is a question uh, whether or not it will be supply or not, uh, there are five to six, uh, you know, uh, reasons why it will it will be deemed to be a supply. For example, uh, a supply without consideration, if it's happening, uh, 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 you know, in a very specific manner, then it's supposed to be a deemed supply. Obviously, that is forming under the part of the law. So we'll have to see whether any transaction is happening uh, which will fall within the deemed supply definition and there, is, there are exceptions to deemed supply also. Uh, so we have to understand whether any activity which according to us there is no supply but still the law uh, will look at it as a deemed supply. Again an example would be transfer of business asset. So if you're transferring any business asset with a, with a consideration uh, the law says that it's a deemed supply. Uh, so uh, you know it's not a supply of goods or services but it's supply of uh, the entire transfer of business then is supply uh, to be considered and the credit uh, allocated to the supply will be the question uh, on which the reversal will be applicable. Uh, the tax rate we discussed, uh, also one more important aspect we have to remember, the, the transaction will be broken up into three aspects. Taxable, exempted and zero rated. Taxable would be taxed at 5%. Zero rated supplies are the supplies wherein it is going to be taxable but at zero rate. So uh, uh, why it is relevant to know is because exempt supplies would not be liable to be taxed and there is no tax on the exempt supplies. But under the exempt supplies, there will be no credit that will be available. Vis-a-vis -vis under the zero supplies, uh, there would be credit which will be available. For example, export of goods or services. Now that is going to be zero rated. Uh, so for any person in UAE exporting any goods outside UAE, uh, the credit would be available to them and there will be no tax to be paid by them on the export of goods or services that they may be doing. So that's why any transaction that a company is doing in UAE will have to be broken up into three baskets. The taxable basket of 5%, the zero rated basket uh, which will be beneficial from credit perspective and uh, the exempt basket which is not liable to be taxed. The recoverable input tax, uh, the way we discuss on the input credit, uh, you know, uh, is where the taxable uh, supplies, wherever the company is going to have, and they would be claiming the credit so that the offset they can knock off and pay the net value to the government. Uh, per se, if you ask me, uh, uh, the executive regulations which are going to come out, they will spell out on any credit that will not be available to the company. Otherwise, uh, the intent would be all credits or all expenditure which are used uh, in providing uh, the supply on the output side should be made available as a credit. Tax returns uh, uh, is uh, also obviously relevant, but uh, the executive regulation will spell out more on that. Uh, it is expected that a threshold uh, will be given uh, you know, to the companies uh, wherein they may have, uh, uh, if they are crossing the threshold, they will have to file returns monthly. And if they are not crossing the threshold, uh, the, or rather, if they are crossing the threshold, they will be filing quarterly, uh, uh, you know, quarterly or monthly, as the case may be. And uh, that threshold will be deciding factor to file the to decide the periodicity of filing the returns. It will be monthly or quarterly, as the case may be. Registration obviously uh, is required. Uh, you know, there is a two concepts of registration: one is voluntary and one is mandatory. If the threshold of uh, 0 0.35375 uh, uh, million is crossed, then a th mandatory registration will be required uh, by the company in UAE. The next concept is very relevant, and Shiraz, you may just uh, help me with any uh, inputs that you have on the tax grouping. This is a, a new concept, per se, if you ask me, uh, which is very exciting for people. Uh, the tax group, uh, wherein uh, you know the conditions uh, mentioned. Under the law is the place of establishment should be done in, in UAE for any group. 
they should be related party and the control uh, should be on one entity uh, to the another uh, the concept being uh, uh, you know is that if there is a group and there are various legal entities uh, uh, the the government is allowing them to apply for one registration wherein they will be looked by the eye of law as one person so if uh, assuming say we have an xyz group and that group has say 25 legal entities and the license is in uae entire 25 entities can form part in the one tax group umbrella and uh, the way uh, the law is drafted is the way wherein inter company transactions will not be taxed at all and they will be also doing compliances as one person so uh, the industry uh, currently is looking forward uh, for this work uh, for this grouping uh, activity if the conditions the three conditions mentioned under the law is fulfilled so that they can uh, get submissions and uh, you know uh, meet the procedures requirement under one umbrella so uh, is there any thought that you have shiraz on this yeah as jagger mentioned uh, if you have a vat group there's three main consequences the first consequence is that you you have to file a single return which is good because if you didn't have a vat group each individual company or establishment branch or rep office would be required to file a separate vat return uh, the second consequence as jagger mentioned was that intercompany transactions are ignored uh, from a vat perspective if you didn't have this vat group supplies of goods and services between related parties would also be taxable on the downside um, i think that you know once you have a group you have to have a representative member which accounts for vat in the event that that representative mem member does not comply um, each and every company within the group is jointly and severally liable uh, i think that law talks about you know having an establishment here so you can't a lot of people ask the question could you have a group across the gcc uh, the answer is you can't because you need to you need to have the establishment inside the uae um, that's the first thing the second thing is you need to be related parties and the law and the regulations as i understand them to be will have a very wide definition of related parties the first thing they look at is control so does one entity control the other either by shareholding or voting rights and there's also some additional criteria in terms of uh, regulatory, economic and financial nexus. So the typical things you could look at, even if you don't have any control by shareholding or voting rights, would be do you have common customers? Uh, do you have common management? Uh, are you using common assets within the business? So all these things are, are things you could actually use to say that we're part of the same group. And this uh, situation is very applicable here because you may have someone uh, who's the legal owner, uh, but he's not the beneficial owner. So it might be the management is being run by a foreign company, uh, and then the, the same foreign company has another business in the UAE, but the foreign company is not the legal owner of either business. However, there's a link through common management. So yeah, this is the basic criteria of a group. Like I said, it's quite wide. Uh, and I think the key is you could apply for a group uh, based down to the tax authority to accept or not, uh, whether whether they allow you to set up as a group. And I think that even if you don't set up as a group, perhaps to avoid VAT uh, by manipulating the thresholds and so on, the tax authority could still group you from a VAT perspective. I think these were the key points. So I'll, I'll pass back to Jigar. Hey, thank you, Shilas. That's, that's pretty uh, relevant for all of us to know uh, that tax grouping is something which is put forward uh, not only from industry but also from government side. Uh, you know, from the way they can handle the administrative perspective. Tax invoicing. Uh, one very relevant aspect uh, is uh, a company under the law is bound to raise the invoice within 14 days of completion of uh, the supply. So uh, one have one will have to track the date of completion. Uh, obviously, uh, even that is something which we have to, you know, calculate and see on when and how the completion is uh, calculated. But within the 14 days of completion, the tax, uh, the law is mandating uh, the companies to raise their invoice. And obviously, the reason would be to raise the invoice at the right time uh, so that the date of supply that we discussed earlier is calculated accordingly and the taxes are paid at the right time vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, you know, delayed manner. Designated zone again a biggest uh, you know discussion around it. In fact, one would be too less to talk on designated zone considering UAE uh, as a country. But uh, just to briefly have giving you heads up that designated zone uh, you know under the law is supposed to be uh, treated as a foreign soil. And uh, the executive regulation uh, which is going to come up is going to throw light much in a better manner on how and what will be 
treated as designated zone. Uh, obviously, we all know that in UAE there are more than 45 to 50 free zones, uh, you know, currently, uh, and all are expecting that it should be covered under the designated zone. However, uh, we have our own views around it. Uh, probably this is not the right forum to discuss this at length, but uh, very few would be covered is what the expectation is. Uh, the taxability of designated zone would be very simple. Uh, any transfer or supply happening within designated zones uh, will not be liable to tax. Any supply happening from outside, uh, uh, you know, UAE to designated zone will also not be liable to tax. Any supply happening from designated zone to uh, the UAE entity that will be liable to uh, VAT because that's coming into UAE as an import. Uh, the way we have to look at it, and any supply happening from uh, the UE entity to a designated zone uh, should be considered as a deemed export. So again, that will be not liable to VAT per se. So this is the expectation that we have. Uh, obviously, the executive regulations, once it is pronounced, uh, these uh, clarity would be emerging uh, in a detailed manner. I, think I had a yeah. few points on that. Sure, sure. Yet today, there's been no official announcement on how designated zones will be treated. Uh, the law was issued around August time, and the law, as Jigger said, mentioned three things. The first thing is that it told you that if you're designated zone, you'd be regarded as outside the UAE. Second thing it told you is that supplies between designated zones uh, will not be subject to VAT. And uh, thirdly, uh, and rather contradictingly, uh, it told you that the regulations will tell you the circumstances in which a designated zone would effectively be taxable. So as Jigger said, I think there's, there's a few things here. When you're talking about designated zones, um, the supplies um, you know, from overseas into the designated zone. The supplies that take place within the designated zone. The supplies that take place between designated zones. And the supplies that take place from designated zones into the mainland and vice versa, from the mainland to the designated zone. So I think the expectation is, and we've all, we, we've expected this for quite a long time, that there'll be a distinction between fenced and unfenced free zones. And broadly speaking, that uh, you know, fence-free zones would be regarded uh, as designated zones, uh, and they have to be confirmed in that way. Uh, so obviously, the regulations don't tell you what designated zone is, but I'm just sharing my expectation here. So, for fence-free zones are likely to be regarded uh, as, uh, as as designated zone, and the consequence of that probably will be that the goods um, coming into the designated zone uh, will not not be uh, treated as imports because they go into a designated zone, which is outside the UAE. In terms of supplies within the designated zone of those same goods, or goods that have been manufactured, or, or the supply of those to another designated zone, that should also not be subject to VAT. And the third point, in terms of the supplies of goods from the designated zone then to the mainland, then they should be subject to VAT. In terms of supplies to from the mainland to the designated zone, I think this is a, a confusing area. My personal expectation is that these will be taxable in the normal way. So, because like I said, the law tells you what designated zone is, but it tells you that it'll tell you the circumstances in which um, you know the, the designated zone will be regarded as taxable. And my expectation is, so for example, as a law firm, if we provided services to a designated zone, that should be taxable. Uh, in the same way, you might have a shop which sells cigarettes. In a, in a designated zone to individual people like me and you. Uh, now, in the state, uh, in, in the mainland, that would be taxable. My expectation is that that would be taxable in the designated zone. This is just to give you a, broad, uh, a few broad highlights, uh, but we could discuss it later in the Q&A Q &A if you have more questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much. All right, next is uh, the penalties uh, there, you know, uh, obviously we will not go in the detailed uh, penalties, but we all are aware about the fact that the government would be strict enough uh, for any, uh, uh, you know, uh, penal consequences if the taxes are not paid appropriately. And if there is any evasion or, uh, you know, uh, a reason of fraud or misstatement, then obviously the, uh, the penalty will go to a next level altogether where prosecution provisions and five times of the entire tax evaded may also be asked uh, to be paid immediately. So uh, uh, we, we, we are almost uh, through with 25 minutes. Uh, uh, we have 20, 25 minutes more before the Q&A round. So if anyone would have any questions, you may please put out, uh, put out in the chat box uh, so that we can take up the questions uh, uh, once we are done with the next 25 minutes. Uh, the place of supply uh, slide that we are looking at, uh, you know, uh, the way we discussed, if the supply is happening within UAE, 
uh, UAE VAT would be applicable. And if the place is applied outside UAE, uh, UAE VAT should not be liable to be uh, charged. Uh, the place of supply for goods is the place where uh, the supply takes place. So if I'm uh, if A is supplying goods to B and the supply is happening uh, from say uh, Dubai to Sharjah, then the supply is happening within UAE and hence place of supply becomes uh, UAE. Similarly, uh, if that same example, uh, there is services being provided, uh, you know, the, the place of supply is a supplier's uh, residence. So for, uh, for example, uh, if the supply is happening from again Dubai to Sharjah, uh, you know, that's within UAE and uh, uh, the supply, the place of supply would be considered to be within UAE. Now, uh, what and where we have to see is how the cross-border transactions will happen within GCC and outside GCC. Obviously, uh, the detailed provisions are there to analyze and understand whether the taxable, uh, you know, the transaction will be falling within the taxable net or not uh, for any export or uh, import transaction. So the basic principles will have to be followed, but also specific rules are given for any cross-border transactions uh, for which the goods or uh, services will have to be linked and seen whether it is happening within UAE or not. Date of supply, uh, again, you know, uh, very quickly, the three three important uh, trigger points which they have kept uh, uh, for the date of supply is the date of invoice, the receipt of the consideration or the completion of the service uh, for the service sector and uh, for the goods, it is the date on which the goods are transferred. So either of it, whenever, uh, you know, uh, either of it, earlier of it uh, will be done, the date of supply gets triggered. For example, uh, if the supply is pending to be completed and uh, the invoice is pending to be raised, but there is an advance amount that has been received, then the date of supply is triggered and the company or the supplier will have to pay taxes of VAT uh, on the advances that they have recovered. Coming to the important uh, pointers of do's and don'ts. Uh, so obviously, uh, you know, there are various aspects. One of the aspects uh, which we would like to start off saying is, uh, you know, the thought process of understanding that there is a tax change or uh, a tax getting introduced uh, into a new region versus uh, an opportunity for the companies to ensure that the businesses are structured uh, appropriately uh, because of the new law coming into picture. So that mindset will have to be ensured. Uh, you know, uh, before we uh, start thinking about a tax change versus a business opportunity uh, and to structure the transaction in a manner wherein nothing goes wrong as far as the business is concerned. In fact, uh, business as usual uh, is something which one should uh, target to ensure that uh, the new law does not hamper them at all. And if there is any opportunity, then obviously not even business as usual, better business uh, is what we can look at. And there are various reasons why we believe that uh, the companies will have to uh, think through uh, in the coming 47 days to ensure that the right, uh, uh, you know, uh, actions are taken up. Some of it we have mentioned here, one, uh, conducting an impact study on the business operation wherein transaction level uh, impact we have to see, uh, the company will have to ensure that uh, all the transactions on the procurement side and on the output side is mapped appropriately to see how VAT is going to be charged on the input side and how they are going to charge VAT on the customers, whether it's zero rated, exempted, taxable, whether there is any restriction of the credit uh, to ensure that the impact is uh, very clearly uh, documented and understood. Updating ERP systems, uh, obviously the, uh, the activity of raising invoice, raising POs, uh, maintaining registers, filing returns, everything will be happening through the systems, uh, the, the ERPs which are used by the companies. Uh, it is relevant for all of us to update the ERP systems. Uh, the relevant uh, ERP, whichever the company is using, uh, the, uh, you should be talking to the ERP vendor and ensuring that uh, to check with them whether there is any patch or any uh, you know update or upgrade given by the ERPs from the VAT perspective, and whether after giving the patch or the upgrade, still there is any requirement that is to be given is something which one has to see. Ensure vendor customer communication. Uh, again, that is the requirement. In fact. Uh, we feel that it's the right time to even communicate now uh, rather than later uh, that, you know, this is what is upcoming and this is what your intention is. For example, if your product is uh, taxable at 5%, ideally your communication to the customer should be done that we are from 1st of January, you will be raising your invoices, uh, you know, with a tax of 5%. So if there is any, uh, you know, uh, reason for them to believe that this is not correct, they would come back to you before the implementing date so that when the actual date comes in for go live, uh, you don't have any ambiguity. 
revisit the supply chain model so if the supply chain is long enough uh, or rather even for that matter you know we, we have an import we have a distributor we could have uh, a trader or a retailer arm so the entire supply chain uh, once once a uh, revisit would be required to ensure that vat is not coming as a cost in the supply chain so ideally uh, the supply chain current versus the supply chain in future uh, because of the credit flow uh, the the impact should be very low or other uh, we should say there is no impact uh, per se on the cost to the company is what one has to see and if there is any cost whether there is any reason for you to structure the supply chain in a different manner uh, in the coming days so that come first jan and your supply chain uh, the model that you are working under does not have a big impact to you record keeping and compliance management uh, again very relevant uh, we will have to ensure that the right record keeping is done obviously earlier there was no law so this was not a stressful activity but uh, considering the fact that the law is now there uh, you know once the uh, a year or two years will be lapsed uh, what will happen is the audits will start conducted we conducted by the department so if, at the time of audits or at the time of submissions uh, these record keeping activity will have to be very robust and uh, it is expected by the companies that they will have all the records in place uh, to ensure that the right compliances are done by them revisit the contractual obligation and pricing policies uh, so you know the, from legal and sales perspective my next slides we will talk about this but uh, there is a reason for revisiting the obligations to ensure that the companies are not going out of pocket transition management uh, most important so whatever is happening in the next few days uh, and coming the you know first jan it will be relevant for companies to ensure the transition is done appropriately uh, there is no ambiguity on uh, situations or the transactions uh, so that the taxes are paid appropriately for example if you are raising an invoice in the month of december but you are receiving the money in the month of january whether there will be tax to be paid or not uh, such kind of questions or vice versa for that matter uh, has to be answered now so that we do the appropriate action at the right time human resource planning and training again this one slide i have on hr uh, section which i will take very quickly so do's and don'ts for sales and procurement uh, i will not run through the slide uh, by talking all the points uh, just briefly giving heads up on aspects uh, you know why we think uh, and obviously we, uh, you all can read the slide but uh, the reason for us uh, uh, you know to believe the sales and procurement uh, side when one has to look at it in detail uh, they will not be the finance or the tax guys who will understand vat very simply uh, for them we'll have to explain them that the pricing policies will have to be amended Uh, for example, if you have a hundred dirham product today, tomorrow that product will be hundred and five, including five of VAT. Uh, but if your customers are not going to claim credit of five for whatsoever reason, then uh, the product cost for the customer goes hundred and five versus the hundred. So there is a reason for uh, the competition or the market to have an impact on your product uh, uh, to the extent of five percent. If that person is claiming credit, uh, the customer is claiming credit, then. again uh, there should be no change for them so the pricing policies uh, uh, you know will have to be determined and rather strategized to ensure that the correct policies are adopted by your company to ensure that the right type of sales mechanism is conducted same thing happens on the procurement side as well wherein you will have to see your procurement in detail to see where all you are going to claim credit is there any restriction for you to claim credit and uh, on the procurement side whether there is any credits that will get restricted uh, because of your output liability to ensure that the right procurement is happening even for that matter if importation if if a company is importing goods today but if uh, uh, the local procurement would be better of situation in future probably that call will have to be taken uh, from the vat perspective legal uh, uh, you know one of the examples which i generally take is the contractual arrangement uh, people have uh, you know for example if a uh, contract is uh, inclusive contract for example again my uh, you know example if the product sold is uh, say 100 dirham product and the contract says this is for 100 dirham uh, which is inclusive of taxes as a matter of fact then uh, the the supplier will go out of pocket the the the, the one has to remember that the law does not mandate the recipient to make the payment of taxes the law is mandating the supplier to make the payment it's only through the contractual relationship Uh, the uh, the indirect taxes gets passed on to the recipient of the uh, services or goods and hence it is relevant for all contractual obligations to be in place to ensure that supplier can recover the taxes from the uh, recipient and ensuring that uh, they don't go out of pocket so if the contracts are not talking about tax not talking about change of law 
not talking about recovery of taxes, then it's the right time for adding an addendum to the contract to ensure that right type of liabilities are transferred to the recipient uh, of supplier goods. Accounts in IT, IT we discussed about the ERP, uh, you know, the charter of accounts, the record keeping activity, the, the testing activity before the law comes in, etc, etc will have to be done uh, from information technology perspective to ensure that the patches are installed and the customization is done to the most appropriate extent and uh, the, the, uh, the during the go live period there is no uh, reason for going out of system uh, so uh, you know a situation will have to be imagined and planned in a manner wherein come 1st of january and your invoices are raised uh, most appropriately in the format the law is designing uh, containing all the contents the law is demanding and uh, you know the taxes around it uh, so to ensure that the right documents are issued by the system itself Accounts, uh, uh, obviously, uh, the record keeping we discussed, uh, that is something which has to be done uh, for a period of time as per the law and uh, to ensure that whenever uh, there, is a uh, there is a submission to be done with the department, uh, the accounts are uh, supporting the tax returns that are filed monthly or quarterly. Finance, obviously, uh, uh, you know, uh, the VAT impact on the finances, on the working capital will have to be calculated. Uh, what we recommend our clients are, you know, take up one year, uh, any year which is a recent year, uh, and plot those numbers uh, with a with a 10 or 20 percent of inflation in it uh, to see how much working capital would be required by you. So, uh, to the shock of our knowledge, when we did that, there was a huge working capital required on the procurement side uh, for various of our clients, uh, uh, which was not known earlier. So, uh, come uh, the first quarter next year. Uh, uh, the, the companies may require a working capital if the uh, debtors and the creditors policies and the procurement uh, strategies are very different. For example, if you are procuring uh, uh, on day one, but if you are selling in day 90, uh, your, your, your money would be blocked, uh, uh, which will be to the extent 5% more than the earlier blockage. And that calculation will have to be done uh, in the most appropriate manner so that you don't go uh, out of business or uh, you know uh, the the way you do business does not change so that calculation will have to be done on the working capital also the tax cost so if there is any credit or any uh, 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 you know uh, input credit which is not going to be recoverable by you that has to be calculated immediately so that we know the the cost of provision of services or supply of goods is going to be increased to that extent and that's the main finance and the tax work that is going to be revolving around the VAT. HR, uh, uh, again, uh, you know, we don't really realize that there is a requirement, but from HR perspective as well, uh, we will have to know how much compliance will have to be done in future, uh, you know, how, whether uh, any planning will have to be done to recruit new people uh, within uh, the team so that, you know, in-house capabilities of handling compliances would be enhanced, whether there is any training required uh, to all the employees uh, across, so for example, the way we discuss on sales and procurement, if the pricing policies has to be determined, that, that, that will also be required to be trained to the sales force and that's the that's way we'll have to plan the HR uh, you know wherein uh, we don't uh, have to wait uh, till the last minute to update the employees but uh, we, we plan in a manner wherein we recruit we explain we train and we are ready to uh, go live as far as Pakistan is concerned. So uh, with this uh, you know we are done with the slides um, uh, what I have is uh, some questions uh, for you Shiraj uh, uh, you know, we can uh, get the, those answers for me and uh, then I will keep the platform open for all uh, and we can answer all the questions which have been coming on the chat box. Uh, starting off with the first question, Shiraj, uh, uh, you know, how, how prepared uh, are the businesses in UAE, uh, mm -hmm. according to you, uh, from VAT perspective, considering 47 or 45 days more uh, are pending with them? How are they prepared on a macro level, if you can answer? <coughs> I think in my experience, uh, some of the larger businesses are more well prepared uh, and they started their preparations more than one year ago. Uh, I think typically speaking, when you're talking about introducing a new VAT law, uh, some of the larger organizations need typically more than, more than between six months and 18 months. Uh, and some of them started their preparation two years ago. Uh, but I think in terms of a lot of the smaller businesses, most of them are unprepared. Uh, I think at a higher level, I'll probably say, um, under 20% of the businesses are prepared. Uh, that's my, uh, that's been my experience so far. So, uh, you know, um, 
in fact i will uh, uh, shoot a, another question which is popping in my mind because of the answer that you have given is considering 20% or almost you know all the big business houses are ready do you really feel or uh, what is your view uh, that is is first january realistic date or is there a reason for us all to believe that there is a uh, you know push that may be coming in a lot of people are asking this question whether vat will be implemented uh, on the 1st of january 2018 Uh, as far as uh, the tax authorities are concerned uh, for a long time now they've been raising awareness and they've made it clear that vat will be implemented on the 1st of january 2018 uh, of course the law was issued uh, in august and it was gazetted in september and that law confirms uh, the start date of 1st of january 2018 there's been nothing since then which leads me to believe uh, that this date will be changed delayed Uh, as far as the tax authorities are concerned you know the, the main thing which they need uh, is the, the systems to be ready because of course vat will be assessed on a self assessment basis so the uh, the responsibility for compliance is on the supplier and not on the tax authorities uh, so for this reason i think that you know the, the, there's there's no expectation that the day will be delayed and uh, we, we should be going live on the 1st of january as expected okay so uh, lots of work coming up so, just one other point i wanted to mention obviously many people have been based here in the region for a long time uh, and they used to laws being delayed uh, and this is uh, the reason why uh, large sections of the business community thought perhaps things would be delayed uh, but of course vat is slightly different it's a revenue generating law and i think in the first year the expectation is that around 12 billion dirhams of revenue would be generated second year that will go up to 20 billion So for each month of delay you're talking about loss of revenue of 1 billion uh, i don't think that's going to happen no so uh, such so is, is it too late for companies to start off uh, work around uh, getting ready for the vat or uh, even 45 days is a good time uh, for anyone uh, for at least the msme or the mid level segment uh, to be ready uh, from vat perspective so that they can go live by first january I think 45 days is obviously pushing it but you know everyone needs to comply and, and they need to be ready on the 1st of January. I think 45 days is sufficient work uh, to at least do some things which you can do. You can't do everything but you should focus on what you can do. Uh, and I think an impact assessment is actually recommended because you need to understand uh, the impact of VAT transaction by transaction and also on the supply chain for you to make decisions on pricing for you to assess your cash flow uh, for you to assess your IT requirements in terms of reporting um, so definitely uh, some work needs to be done uh, in order to uh, you know get ready uh, for VAT uh, and obviously the, 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 what 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 should change now is the approach taken towards that work but there's there's no replacement sure um, so what you said is supply chain Uh, and uh, impact assessment would be the key aspect is there anything else in the 45 days you think that would be most relevant uh, probably i can just say from my side i think it uh, yeah. would be most relevant so it supply chain uh, you know what else could be the most important aspect that they need to pick up yeah, i think the key points are you know the it side uh, which means making sure that you map all the transactions uh, your your invoice your documentation is there uh, your invoicing complies with the requirements under the new law Uh, then also customer and supplier management so of course you know uh, you might end up in the situation where your contract is, uh, is is basically silent on vat and because you don't do anything about it you might end up uh, taking the hit for vat so managing these relationships communicating with them making amendments to your contracts uh, that's another point i i think that's the key thing and of course to comply you need to understand you know how does vat impact all your transactions because when you produce that first vat return you know you need to have all the output vat and all the input vat so you need to assess you know how does vat apply to all your transactions i think these are the key aspects <clears throat> uh sachin how do you think so this 45 days obviously would be a roller coaster for all of us uh, but coming first jan how complicated the compliance is would be according to you I think of course the regulations haven't yet been issued in final form um I think most things are known already uh, but there are some gray areas or some areas which will require further clarity so in terms of producing uh, that first vat return for most of the most of us you know it's it's a challenge in terms of you know getting your process systems ready uh you know 
in order to comply. Uh, but then also to understand the impact of VAT on the transactions. And like I said, for most things it's clear, for some areas more clarity is required. Uh, so for some businesses it may be more complex than others. Well, I think for 90% of the businesses, uh, things should be relatively clear. Sure. Um, uh, so we would like to understand, uh, is there any way where the uh, the businesses can represent uh, uh, you know, to the government? So, uh, you know, uh, I can just give a brief understanding in India, wherever there is a, uh, you know, draft regulations which were out, uh, whenever uh, there was a ground to represent to the government uh, for businesses to say that these things are not uh, good for them or detrimental to the businesses for various reasons. For example, uh, if a product is, uh, say a medical product is taxed as if 12% uh, and it was not taxed earlier, the representations were filed to say that these products are not to be taxed and keep it zero rated or keep it at minimal 5%. <clears throat> I know the percentage is not something which is going to be discussed uh, in GCC or UAE. But if there is any representations or there is any uh, uh, concerns that the industry is having or businesses are having, is there any opportunity or door opened uh, for the businesses to go back to the government and talk to them? I think the first thing is that the law obviously was issued in August. The, the regulations are due any day now. Uh, so in terms of making representations to government and that resulting in changes to the law and regulations, that's of course not going to happen. Uh, I think it's too late for that uh, and I think the tax authorities and the Ministry of Finance uh, have already been taking feedback from different businesses uh, in drafting these regulations and laws. There was no formal consultation period as such as there was in Saudi um, but you know the, behind the scenes there, have, uh, there has been consultation and they have really carefully thought about uh, you know the socio-political considerations uh, and hence, you know, the zero rating for certain sectors like the healthcare sector, uh, the education sector, and, you know, the precious metals, uh, which is part of the GCC framework agreement. Um, in terms of can representation still be made? Yes, there are still some complicated areas uh, where the VAT law doesn't fit naturally to those sectors. And you can make representations on those regards. But of course, the tax authorities, uh, they're very, very busy uh, and they're inundated with queries. Uh, so in terms of getting responses, it might be quite difficult in practice. Sure. So Shiraz, I am uh, done with the question which I had uh, in my mind and thanks, uh, really thank you for giving those insights. Uh, uh, there are a few questions which, uh, uh, you know, uh, the participants are throwing. Uh, uh, I quickly uh, take those questions. Some of it we've already answered, but uh, because of the time uh, issues, we can take four questions. Uh, there are more than 12 as of now and chat box is pouring questions now again. What we will do is we will answer your questions uh, by writing back to you in an email. But four uh, questions which I have selected to uh, ask Shiraz is one, whether supply from mainland to designated zone is, is taxable. I think he answered that thing, uh, but probably you can just take it. Yeah, as I said, you know, if you're in a designated zone, so let's just say, uh, you know, fence free zone, you know, this is regarded as outside uh, the UAE, but not for all supplies. So my expectation was, you know, if you're producing goods within a designated zone, you're importing goods. For those purposes, uh, the supply will be regarded outside the UAE. The question here is whether the supply from mainland uh, to designated zone is taxable. Um, and again, you, there's two types of supplies, there's services and goods. You know, my expectation is that this beneficial treatment of free zones uh, or designated zones will not apply for services. So if you're providing services to uh, an entity which is in a designated zone, I would expect that to be subject to VAT in the normal way. Um, so if, if, if we, Al Tamimi, as a law firm, provide services to someone in the mainland and someone in a designated zone, I expect no difference. In terms of services, uh, in terms of goods, sorry, I, I expect uh, similar treatment as well. So for example, maybe, um, maybe they're procuring some goods um, inside the designated zone. And one example of that is electricity and water. So you've got Diva, if Diva raises a bill to a business in, uh, in, in the mainland, uh, they charge VAT. And um, if, if they didn't charge VAT uh, to an entity which is established in a designated zone, it, won't, it wouldn't make sense. So again, my expectation is uh, for, for those types of supplies, uh, VAT should apply in a normal way. Sure. Uh, there's one question saying, taxability on employee salaries, as there is no specific exemption. 
employee salaries won't be subject to VAT uh, because it's not uh, a supply of a service as such. Uh, it's an employment contract. And a uh, salary won't be regarded uh, as a supply for VAT purposes. Yes. Uh, the, 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 another question is, uh, what will be the taxability of reimbursements? Uh, so let, let me put it uh, uh, in a detail, little detail manner from my side. So if there's a reimbursement of any cost happening for provision of any services versus a reimbursement of a cost happening for uh, uh, wherein the supplier is making any payment uh, on behalf of the recipient, mm -hmm. for example, uh, as Al Tamimi as a law firm is, uh, uh, you know, providing some services, and uh, they will be reimbursing of cost of, uh, say, uh, uh, the travel uh, to the from the from the clients, versus Al Tamimi as a uh, law firm is providing, say, uh, a, a service, and they are paying some statutory fees to the government and reimbursing themselves from the client for making the payment of statutory fees uh, to the government on behalf of the client. What will be the taxability? Yeah, I think as Jigar said, uh, the key question is in terms of, you know, what what are you actually recovering in terms of expenses? And is that a reimbursement or disbursement? So to typically, you know, if, if what you're recovering uh, is, a, is, is a cost related to an underlying service, uh, then that would be subject to VAT. On the other hand, if what you're recovering is a disbursement, uh, you know, which is a payment you're making on behalf of someone, then th that will not be subject to VAT. Just to illustrate, if we're providing some services and as part of providing those services, we incur some expenses, for example, phone bills, which we recharge to a client, that's a reimbursement. So that phone bill is, a, is basically a cost of the service uh, and therefore that would be subject to VAT. And as Jigger mentioned, you know, on, on the other hand, we may pay some fees uh, to the government and uh, on behalf of a client. And these aren't our, our fees, these are the client fees. So we're just acting as an agent on behalf of the client and uh, we're paying those fees and then we're recovering those fees from the client. This should not be subject to VAT. Uh, this is a disbursement. I think the key thing is, you know, whether you're uh, the principal or whether you're the agent. So in the former situation, you're the principal and you're uh, claiming a reimbursement of expenses. In the latter situation with the government, you're effectively an agent. Sure, makes sense. Uh, uh, almost two more questions now. Uh, one, it says whether importer of service who is not registered in UAE would be liable to pay VAT under reverse charge mechanism, looking to the fact that Article 48.1 applies only to registered importer and Article 49 up only applies to importer of goods. So the question she has is basically if you are a non-registered person in UAE uh, and you are importing any services, whether you will be liable to pay VAT on that or not? I think the first thing is if you're non-registered, uh, does importing the goods or services, because uh, basically in terms of your registration threshold, imports also taken into account. So if that takes you above the threshold, uh, then you're required to register for VAT purposes. Assuming that you're not registered and the supply that you receive, uh, the, the import that you're making, um, you know, that you won't be required to account for VAT if it doesn't take you over the registration threshold. So in terms of goods, you know, the import of record uh, will be required to pay import VAT. Uh, and this would be at the time of import, uh, so at, at the border. Uh, in the case of services, the supply will not be regarded as taking place uh, in the UAE uh, if the receive, uh, recipient of the supply uh, is, is not registered for VAT in the UAE. Sure. Um, next is how acquisition transaction which are done offshore or the businesses in UAE will be impacted. All right. So what we can interpret from this is the business is in UAE and the acquisition is happening. The business is owned by a US company. For example, the US company sells uh, the entire business to a UK company, uh, but the business is in UAE. Will that be an impact on VAT? I think the first thing is, is this the supply for VAT purposes? And if you're talking about an acquisition of shares, you know, supply of shares or sale of shares uh, will not be subject to VAT because it's not regarded as a supply. Uh, and generally speaking, otherwise, you know, in order for the supply to be subject to UAE VAT, uh, the supply needs to take place in the UAE. Uh, so even if you have, for example, goods uh, being transferred overseas that do not enter the UAE, even though uh, you know those goods relate to entities uh, 
maybe the supply is taking place between two UAE entities. If the goods don't come to the UAE and they're basically sold offshore, that will not be subject to UAE VAT. But yeah, going back to the shares, you know, that's not even a supply for VAT purposes. Sure, and Siraj, also I think uh, Article 7 would help wherein it says that supply in special cases wherein will not be considered a supply and the uh, surplus 2 refers to the transfer of whole or an independent part of businesses from a person to a taxable person for the purpose of continuing the business efforts transfer. So even that yes. situation could be uh, useful. Yeah, right? I think that's a little bit different. So when you're transferring, uh, you know, a business as a going concern, whether the whole business or part of the business, uh, so it might even be a real estate business, but but that, that's not so relevant. So if you're talking about real estate in another country, that, that the supply would not be here anyway. Uh, so, you know, when you're talking about overseas, in most cases, the supply wouldn't be here. But yeah, e even if you transfer a business in the UAE, not the shares, uh, we're talking about business. So you're transferring the assets. If you transfer the business as a whole, uh, that is outside the scope of UAE VAT. And when I talk about business, I mean, you know, the contracts, uh, the under, so it might be a real estate business, for example, a leasing business. If you transfer a commercial property, that would be subject to VAT. But if you transfer a business which basically leases commercial properties and you transfer, you know, the, yeah, you transfer all the, the, the actual assets, you transfer the underlying tenancy contracts, uh, you transfer the employees which are working at the leasing business, then this collectively uh, is a transfer of a business uh, as a going concern, which is outside the scope of UAE VAT. Uh, but that's a little bit different to the other scenario because you're talking about acquisition outside the UAE. So. Sure. Thank you, Shaz. Uh, the last question, and we have two more minutes to complete. Um, uh, we obviously know that you know the the, the FTA authority has uh, issued uh, a mandate to get registered before 31st of October for 150 million and above, uh, and uh, between 4 to 150 was uh, 30th of sub this is November. Mm -hmm. The question which is revolving around the fact that because executive regulations are not out and the designated zone aspect is not 100% clear yet, mm -hmm. uh, what happens to the companies in designated zone uh, right now, whether they are required to register for VAT or not? Yeah. I, I think the key question is uh, the companies within the designated zone, are they actually making taxable supplies? And if they are making taxable supplies, you know, if the value of those supplies exceeds uh, the mandatory threshold of 375,000 uh, dirhams. And if so, they are required to register just by virtue of the fact that they're in a designated zone doesn't mean that they may not be required to register because they may be making supplies which are taxable uh, in addition to supplies which are outside scope. That's the first point. Uh, the second point is that even if entities in a designated zone uh, are not required to register, they may still be paying some VAT on procurement of goods or services on which they will pay VAT. So the question mark, you know, whether it merits them actually registering to recover that VAT. Uh, in terms of the timelines you mentioned, yes, the, the Federal Tax Authority did uh, issue some timelines for registration. And um, at, at the time, obviously, the expectation was that because the law itself did not contain a deadline for registration, the regulations hadn't been issued at that time. Uh, the expectation was the regulations would contain a deadline. So although the Ministry of Finance obviously issued these timelines uh, to make sure that businesses don't register at the same time, um, which would have a detrimental effect on the system, and they register in a timely way, uh, I think one of the concerns that I had was that, you know, when the regulations are final, when are they going to say uh, the deadline for registration is? And there's two approaches. One approach is that they actually contain deadlines in the law. Uh, the second one is there's a provision to the effect uh, which says that the deadline for registration is as previously announced by the Ministry of Finance. And uh, th that could quite happen. So it might well be that if you haven't, um, if you haven't already registered, uh, you could be subject to late filing penalties, uh, sorry, late registration penalties. Sure. Thank you so much, Shiraz. Uh, uh, we are done with the webinar. Uh, uh, my team could just give the concluding remarks. Thank you, Jigar and Shiraz, for taking time to share your valuable insights with us and helping us gain a much better perspective on the topic. Uh, we hope that the insights shared by our speakers have been useful to all of you listeners. Please feel free to write to us at skp.uae at skpgroup.com if you have any questions or doubts on this topic. We put the you, we put the email ID in chat if you want to refer to that, and we'll be happy to assist you with any of your queries. We also have two more webinars coming up regarding VAT on a few more specific topics. You can see them on screen now. 
and we hope to see you for the next webinar. Thank you for joining us and we hope you have a great day.